campaign. Well, and these are the people who, like you say, they've gone through healing and they're ready to tell the world. That's right. And the Christianity is based on the power of testimony. Jesus exactly. himself is the testimony of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the testimony of the Father and the Son. So testimony is at the heart of Christianity and, and these people are giving testimony. Okay, but not only that, and they can go to silentnomorewareness.org, right, for the yes. information you're talking about. But then let's look at another dimension, which is all those people, some of whom are watching us right now, who regret their abortion but aren't ready to, Step out to be so public. Right. But nevertheless, they want their experience to, to also count in some way. Mm -hmm. Tell us what they can do. Well, they can go to our website also, Father, and they can register anonymously their regret. Yes. Simply, there's a little box there, and you could just check off. If you're a woman, I regret my abortion. If you're a man, I regret lost fatherhood. You only have to put your first name and the state or your first name in your country. Yes. And then for the people who are speaking, for example, uh, one of our good regional coordinators, Teresa Bonaparte, she's from New York. Well, if we have a certain number of men and women who, you know, have registered regret anonymously, she can say in her testimony, I am just one of fill-in-the-blank number of women from New York State who regret their abortion. So yeah. it gives more power to the voices who are right. speaking publicly. We know publicly. they're out there, exactly. but we need to be able to count them somehow. That's and, right. And, and, this, this, and plus, the person who's silently regretting uh, her abortion or the father silently regretting for for uh, uh, having uh, advocated for the, the abortion of his child, can can say, um, I've done something. I've right. added to the strength of these pro-life speakers. And they can get there by IRegretMyAbortion.com. We've made it very easy for them to get directly to the form that you mentioned, IRegretMyAbortion.com. Let's talk about, you know, every, every, every year in January, these three very powerful themes converge. That's right. We're talking about one of them, of course, here, the abortion issue, uh, issue Roe v. Wade, because of Roe v. Wade. Wade. January right. the 22nd, 1973, these twin decisions, Roe and Doe, were decided. Okay, so that's why in January there's the March for Life, there's the Walk for Life, and there's countless other rallies and all marches over the for life. Yes, all over the place. So January, you have this tremendous theme of the equal value of life, including the unborn, has to be defended and advocated. But then two other things happen in January, also in the United States. First of all, the Martin Luther King observance. We have the Martin Luther King holiday uh, uh, and, and uh, coming up the third Monday of, of January. And uh, this man, of course, is honored as a national uh, figure. Why? Because he stood up for the equal dignity of all human life in the context of segregation. The violence of segregation it wasn't just the concept, it was violence. And he was speaking up for his people saying, you know, we're human also. Right. Remember, remember the, 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 the signs that... The, I am a man. Right. I am a man. That's now, right. because, because why, why, were they, why did they have to hold a sign saying, I am, I am a man, these, these, these black men? Because people were denying that. That's right. And isn't that what's happening with the unborn? People are denying. Now, the unborn can't march and say, hey, I'm a Here man too, right. but we can. Exactly. We can march for them. And that's why we do march. You know, so is this not the same movement as, as what the civil rights movement was? Is this not the same advocacy as what the civil rights people fought for? Because didn't Martin Luther King Jr. say and write that he wasn't just advocating the equality of the black man. He was, he was advocating for the, his, his brothers and sisters in the black community. Why? Because their rights were being denied, being denied being at impressed. that point in time. Right. But the reason you speak out against that is because every human being is equal. So he said, I'm advocating for the, the equal dignity of every human being. Well, and you know, Father, Priest for Life, as a Life Talk audience knows, Dr. Alveda King, the niece of Martin Luther King, is part of our pastoral team, has been for a number of years. And we, every year, attend the Martin Luther King events in Atlanta with Alveda and her family. And uh, there has been times, Father, where you have even participated in the services there. And uh, it's very moving, uh, the events there. And uh, I think of Alveda the way she says that... Uh, you know, this is, abortion is the civil rights movement of today. And she's even said that to you and I, that uh, she would actually know that her Uncle Martin would be marching with us the way she marches in Washington Against with us. Against abortion. Yeah, Against exactly. Abortion. Right. The yeah. pro-life movement is, uh, is, is, this is about civil rights. So there's that convergence at this time of year. Right. But then it's it, all, of, both of those, those, uh, those days 
are also happen to fall within the week designated as the week of prayer for Christian unity. And this is, this is amazing because uh, every year, January the 18th to the 25th, is this special observance. Christians praying that prayer of Jesus from the night before he died that we may all be one. The divisions in Christianity are a scandal to the rest of the world, a stumbling block, because they say, well, if this Jesus is, is God, if he's the Savior meant for all people, why are his followers not on the same page? Right. Even about what the Bible says and what it means, why are they not on the same page? And that's a good question. Why aren't we? We've got to get more together. And, and so this is a deep prayer that Christians share. It's, it's a deep commitment that we have in the, in the Catholic community and I personally uh, to, the, to the goal of Christian unity. Now, one of the ways that Christian unity is expressed, and in fact one of the ways to hasten it, is to say, look, we're not going to pretend that there aren't any, any differences. There are. But there are also so, much th so many things on which we agree and on which we can work together. So Christians can join hands, work together against poverty. We can work together against uh, segregation. Christians join together in the civil rights right. movement. We can work together against abortion. And, and, the, and fighting for the rights of the, of the oppressed, uh, fighting for the rights of those who, who, whose rights are ignored, is one of the ways Christians are coming together. I think the pro-life movement is one of the greatest expressions of authentic Christian collaboration that there is. That's right. I mean, you know, when you look at Father, for example, the 40 Days for Life, you know, Christians break praying of all denominations in front of the abortion clinics, which they've been doing for decades, mm -hmm. uh, marching both at the March for Life, the Walk for Life, all these pro-life well, events. the legislative activities, the, the political activities, uh, Christians uh, joining right. hands. And the pregnancy center, you yeah, know, that whole movement. Centers, right. it's, it's Christians coming together and helping with the... I think the, the pro-life really cause has done more to bring Christians together than any other part of being what it means to be a Christian. I mean, just mm -hmm. the fact that uh, so many people have come together, unified, in the pro-life movement. And going back to where we started, the Silent No More Awareness Campaign and Rachel's Vineyard, these great movements for healing after abortion are interdenominational movements. That's right. That's You've right. got people from, 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 from all different backgrounds participating. Well, like for the Silent No More Awareness Campaign, my co-founder is Georgette Forney, who is the president of Anglicans for Life. Right there is your ecumenical uh, unity, right there. That's right. So what a wonderful month this is. That we start a new year as we prepare for the March for Life and so many other pro-life events in January. We've got these people thinking and talking about it. We should, we, should, we should talk about these connections. Preachers should preach about these connections. You know, Martin Luther King, yes, because why? Because human life matters, because people are equal. Um, if skin color can't be a reason for de denying people's rights, then neither can the fact that they were still in the womb. That convergence and Christian unity. Beautiful. That's right. And you know, Father, if someone has never been to the March for Life, never been to the Walk for Life, this is the time. Maybe this is the new year for you. Make your New Year's resolution now to say, you know what, I'm going to get to that March for Life or I'm going to get to the Walk for Life in San Francisco because we know that that has brought so many people into, the, into this abortion battle because of being inspired. You yourself, Father, back in high school, that's what got you into the movement, going to the March for Life. And people can carry those new signs, too. That's right. Women do regret abortion. And men regret lost fatherhood, which we have available at Priest for Life. People can carry those. I mean, that, that doesn't mean they themselves have, have been involved no, in abortion. No, they're just carrying the message of the campaign. The message of the campaign is so important. That's okay, great. thanks, Janet. And uh, thank you, brothers and sisters, for all you do for the cause of life Let's commit once again that whether it's in our preaching or our volunteer activities or uh, what, we, what we say to others on our, uh, online, and I invite you to connect with me on, on Twitter and Facebook, that we will put life first in this new year, that this will be our top priority. Thanks for all you do. Now, Mark, back to you. Thanks, Brother Frank. All right, we're back. Um, I want to talk, we're going to talk about Planned Parenthood here in a minute. We've got a very good guest on this issue. They're our favorite it, punching bag. They are the masters of deception. I've got a, I'm holding here in my hand a report, uh, patient statistics, physical year uh, 2010 from Planned Parenthood of Indiana. And they show that they did 5,580 abortions. And, you know, Planned Parenthood always does this deal of saying that Abortion is such a tiny part of what they do, which is a lie. Right. They're, they're lying. But the but fact is that that's, that's what they claim. And so now they're showing that they had 
244,000 visits and only 5,580. They only killed only. 5,580. Well, like What's the body count of a multi-billion dollar a year organization? Right, 5,500. They only killed 5,580 5, babies. But the interesting thing is they did 13,932 emergency contraceptions. Mm -hmm. They didn't count those. Okay, 18,000 wow. dead babies. They did 254,570 oral contraceptions. Many of those are abortions. Uh -huh. Is this nationwide? No, this is just in Indiana. Oh. 20,000. And um, if you added them all up, uh -huh. but, but see, this is, when I was talking about deception, this is what I'm talking about. They have redefined what pregnancy is. They have. Mm -hmm. Because used to is when the sperm met the egg, that was the beginning of a new life, right? Deception. And it still is. Mm -hmm. That right. biology has not changed. Right. But they claim that until that implants in the woman, she's not technically pregnant. So right. this thing is this amorphous, entity, whatever it is that has been created when the sperm and the egg unite, mm -hmm. is floating within her body, but she's not pregnant yet. Right. And so that's how they get away with not counting all of these very, very early term abortions as abortions, because she's not pregnant. But it's also an example of why we need to, in the pro-life movement, concentrate more, less on talking about abortion and more on talking about ending the life of the unborn child. Yeah. Because when we just talk about abortions, it opens them up to having this sort of deception available to them. But the fact is, uh, they're doing a lot more abortions than what they claim. And this ability to, to creatively redefine what is pregnancy uh, is, well, is a good example of that. What would be their point in lessening the number of abortions? In because they know time? that the American people are extraordinarily uncomfortable with the idea of abortion. The medical community is in, uncomfortable with it. So they want the American people and the medical community to think that it's only done very rarely, only in the most tragic of circumstances, which is a bald-faced lie. But at the same time, they want to say it's a fundamental human right, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's as all-American as apple pie, as what George Teller used to say, baseball, right. apple pie, and abortions. It's all the same thing. Right. Uh, so why would you want to make a human right less available? That, see, that was always my argument about the Bill Clinton argument, safe, legal, and rare. We want to keep make abortions. If abortion is a fundamental human right, as they claim it is. Like freedom of speech. Free, why, we don't say we, we support freedom of speech, but we want to see it be used rarely. Rarely, rarely. This is the only right that we take and say. We want to diminish it. Yeah, we, want, we don't want people to use this right very much. Right. You it's know, they're, a sad right. They're trying to play both ends. They're right. trying to have their cake and eat it too here. Um, but if, if it's. The other thing is, if they, if as they claim, it benefits women, why would you want to see it be rare? Yeah, it's like health food, really. Right. I mean, uh, abortion is like health food if you listen to the rhetoric of these guys. Right. It, yeah, and we've, we've brought up some of that rhetoric in past shows. Anyway, we are now joined with a young lady that's actually from Texas. She's calling us from uh, Canyon, Texas. Lovely Rita, Canyon, Texas. It is pretty. <laughs> and uh, you're not a meter maid, right, Rita? Oh, I never I have been, although funny. everybody that knows about the Beatles calls me meter maid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you are lovely, right? Well, some people would take issue with that. Okay, but. well, not me. We'll particularly Planned Parenthood, yeah. but right. we believe you're lovely, yeah. Rita. Lovely Thank Rita, you. meter maid, calling us from Canyon, Texas. And, which is uh, also lovely. But, which is very lovely. Mm -hmm. Well, it's in Texas. What else could it be? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Grand Canyon of Texas, actually. But anyway, she, um, she actually works for American Life League, our friends Judy uh, Brown and, uh, in uh, Virginia, but she lives in Texas. And uh, Rita, we thank you for being with us today. You have done some uh, writing and some research here recently that I've read, uh, and we've covered some things here on, on Life Talk about the corruption and the scandals that are going on inside Planned Parenthood, financial and, and otherwise, but primarily financial. Um, some of the stuff you've written, you've been pretty bold about and pretty, basically, they're crooks. Well, you know, the, the writing is there. We have to read the writing that's on the wall. Um, earlier this year, I wrote a guest column for the Washington Times about Planned Parenthood's missing millions and and. Where is the money? And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Go ahead. Yeah, we, that's uh, what we want to talk about. I mean, not millions, but a billion, right? Yeah, actually, over a billion dollars is not accounted for. 
let's, before we get into that uh, report, we need to preface that with just a little background information about the Government Accountability Office and its reports about Planned Parenthood. Uh, and let's go back to 2001 because this one is relevant. In 2002, pro-life legislators got together and they asked for information from the Government Accountability Office about Planned Parenthood's expenditures of federal funds that it had received in 2001. Well, the GAO did issue a report in response to that request, and it showed that Planned Parenthood's expenditures of federal money accounted for 79% of its government income. So that was a reasonable amount of income that was accounted for. That makes sense because Planned Parenthood has some other sources of government income, like state and local. So. Mm -hmm. It would appear that this, in this report in 2001, they accounted for a reasonable amount of their federal income. So we march along to 2009, and pro-life legislators realize, hey, Planned Parenthood has received over $2 billion from the government since we last heard anything about what they're doing with the money. So let's have another accounting. Well, the GAO really doesn't like to undertake these reports. You know, they're busy with other things. So a group of 31 pro-life legislators got together, and they once again requested the report about Planned Parenthood spending of federal government monies, and the GAO acquiesced. They produced that report. The, re the numbers were shocking when we saw the report. It accounts for only $657 million of, out of that $2 billion that Planned Parenthood had received during that time period. That's only 32% of its government money accounted for, which it's, leaves us with a huge question, where's the money? What happened to And money? the second question, why is Planned Parenthood not being held accountable for those billions of dollars that we blindly pour into its pockets? So we started to probe to find out, you know, why all that money was not accounted for. And I made another discovery that I thought was relatively shocking. We found out that for the 2001 report, Planned Parenthood actually produced internal audits. The GAO said, we need to see your internal audits. We're trying to produce this report, and they produced them. For the 2002 through 2008 report, Planned Parenthood refused to produce those internal audits. Why do you think that was? Because, because <laughs> it's not required to. Even when information is requested by 31 members of Congress, Planned Parenthood's not required to produce internal audits of its spending, and so it didn't. Well, well wait a minute, so though, Rita. Totally right, but wait a minute, Rita. Mm -hmm. If this could be a public relations nightmare for them, and if I thought I was facing a public relations nightmare, and I had done nothing wrong, and I could prove that I could account for all the money, just because I wasn't required to, I'd do it anyway. You would think so. That's what I would do. I would think that's what any reasonable person or entity would do. But they did not produce their internal audits. Um, and so the GAO relied on information that it could discover through the Single Audit Act. And that act requires that um, Planned Parenthood affiliates who receive more than $500,000 or actually who spend more than $500,000 of government funding annually have to file this report. It's not a real audit, mm -hmm. but it is a report they're required to file. So that's what the GAO uh, relied on in preparing its report, and they found that Planned Parenthood only accounted for 32% of the federal, of the government money. Well, let's, let's make sure people understand, let's make sure people understand something about this. Currently, Planned Parenthood, just in federal dollars alone, is a, a receiving right at about a million dollars a day at the federal trough. That means then that they're only accounting of the million dollars a day that they're receiving, they're only going to account for $320,000. Where is it? And the other $680,000 is just falling into, as you wrote in this article in the Washington Times, it's just falling into some black hole. God, knows where, God knows where it is. That's right. We don't know. God knows. We don't know, and we have no way of finding out. I even went so far as to uh, request under the Freedom of Information Act information about from the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services um, about what they've been doing with regards to Planned Parenthood. I asked for the results of all audits, investigations, evaluations, or other examinations of Planned Parenthood affiliates in the United States, and you won't believe what I got back. 
if I could read just one paragraph of this letter that I got back from the Department of Health and Human Services. It says, I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of such records. If they exist, records of this nature would be exempt from disclosure under Freedom of Information Act exemptions B7A and or B6 and or B7C. Hmm. <laughs> that gets better. These exemptions exempt from mandatory disclosure records compiled for law enforcement proceedings if disclosure could reasonably be expected to interfere with enforcement proceedings or when lacking the subject's consent or an overriding public interest. And so if I don't have Planned Parenthood's consent, I can't get these records apparently. Oh, nice. So where's the money? Wow. It's just it legal it, spaghetti. Well, is I it know in there's... the abortionist pocket or what? In in Washington's case, I know Planned Parenthood of Washington had overbilled uh, the U.S. government yeah, Medicaid, well. by millions of dollars. And when they were audited, they only had to give back something like 20 cents on the dollar. Right. And, I mean, imagine you steal. It's squandered the rest of it. <laughs> wow. if, you, if you steal a million bucks, you only have to give back $200,000 and, and your hands are free. That's well, that's problem. common. That's common. They, they don't make them give back the entire amount that they, that they find that they have taken unjustly. And I guess the biggest case was in California, oh, yeah. where, where they found that um, one, plan, one Planned Parenthood affiliate over the course of two years had overbilled the state to the tune of $5.2 million. And when they found out about it, they said, well, you know what? Yes, you did overbill us $5.2 million. But we're not going to ask for the money back. California's in well, such a bad way, why would it matter? But Rita, one of the things we've seen, we saw it in that situation in California, because I, I worked with some of the attorneys that were involved in some of those suits out there, and we saw this in Washington. Some of the stuff that they're accused of doing is actual criminal fraud. Yeah. It's not just bad bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. For example, they were found to be what's called unbundling, and for people who don't know what that is, it's a situation where, let's say that an insurance company or a Medicaid or someone like that does not pay for abortion. What they will do then is they will go in and do its unbundling, which means they, they take all the individual parts of the abortion, for example, a vaginal swab and uh, cervical dilation and all these other things, and they will just charge for those individually because, right. because the insurance company does pay for them. Right. And it's kind of like saying General Motors won't, can't sell you a car, but they'll, take, they'll sell you the individual parts That's in that car. And, and if you start unbundling, what you find out is then an abortion that you might be able to buy for $400 cash, mm -hmm. all of a sudden is $5,000 if you unbundle it in its component parts, just like it would be with a car. If, you, right. if there's a car out there that you could buy for $25,000, if you unbundle it and sell it as parts, it's a half million dollars. And it's the, same, right. it's the same thing here. That's right, and in some instances, I understand they charge for the bundle, and then they charge for the individual pieces in addition to that. And that's so. criminal fraud. It is sounds criminal. like criminal fraud to me. In in fact, in Kansas, Planned Parenthood of Kansas and Mid Missouri is facing 107 criminal indictments, 23 of which are felonies, and some for illegal abortions, illegal late term abortions in the state of Kansas. But another aspect of this is they had to submit certain records to the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. When they were asked to verify these records, of course, they didn't exist, so they, they recreated them using...